Welcome, everybody. And on behalf of the Bureau of Justice Assistance, uh, congratulations on receiving an award for the Smart Policing Initiative. Um, my name is Chris Sun. As Amada said, I am uh, a co-director of the Smart Policing Training and Technical Assistance Team. We'll get into some of the introductions in a minute. Um, but looking forward to having a nice discussion today about both the uh, the history and goals of the SPI, the resources available to you throughout the SPI, as well as some important details for the grants management aspect of your award. So with that, I am going to hand it off to um, BJA and particularly Kate McNamee, and we'll go through the rest of introductions. Kate? Thanks so much, Chris, and hello, everybody. Welcome to the SPI family. Um, my name is Kate. I am a senior policy advisor at BJA, and uh, I've been with BJA for about 15 years or so now, and um, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you all. Uh, this was, yet again, another competitive year for SPI, and I'm just thrilled um, you know, to have you all on board um, doing such important work that hopefully will inform uh, not only your department and your operations, but also be a benefit to the greater policing community as well. Um, I, just to kind of place me in the process, um, I'm the person who reviewed your application um, when it came in. And my job is to uh, make sure that anything that we fund uh, is uh, aligned with uh, the principles and the practices we want to endorse under SPI um, for excellence in policing and evidence-based practices. And I also make the recommendations uh, to my leadership regarding um, grant funding. Um, so yeah, you you all were are here for a reason. Um, your your application uh, was, you know, of high quality and priority um, for BJ to support. So congratulations again, and I will turn it over to my colleague Gisla to introduce herself and her uh, colleagues in the program's office. Gisla? Hello, my name is Gisla Barnes and I am a state policy advisor in the program's office of the Bureau of Justice of Assistance. Um, I've been with SPI for, I say, a better of maybe eight, nine years. Um, I am happy and um, would like to congratulate everyone on receiving the award. Um, as we get further into the PowerPoint, the presentation, you will learn more about my role, but my role is your main point of contact um, for your program. If you have any questions or issues, um, you could contact me or my coworker, Amy, who will introduce herself. Um, Amy, Kate, and I work as a team along with Ch Chip, um, with Chris and CNA. So um, we kind of keep up with everyone's portfolio. In case one is out, you can always reach out to the other. But um, I will go ahead and turn it over to uh, my colleague, Amy. Hello. Uh, my name is Amy Romero. I am a state policy advisor with the program's office. Uh, we will be talking about uh, our roles in a, in a little bit during this presentation, but I am uh, also your, your point of contact for many of you. Thank you. Hey, thank you all. Just real briefly, wanted to introduce everybody to the training and technical assistance team. We'll talk about the roles that we play um, as a team supporting you, but uh, as I mentioned, I'm the co-director of the TTA program. My background is in uh, evaluation and research practice partnerships. I have over 15 years of experience implementing and evaluating research practice partnerships, such as those that you guys will be implementing through the SPI, and um, looking forward to, to working with every one of you. Um, Dr. Cauldron, I think, is still trying to join, but um, he leads uh, the SPI TTA team with me. 
he was the original director of the SPI TTA program when it began in 2009, has a rich background in policing, education, evaluation, and um, support for agencies across the, um, across the country. Now I'll turn it over to um, Dr. Ken Novak, who is also part of the SPI TTA leadership team. Ken? Thanks, Chris. Uh, my name is Ken Novak. Um, I am uh, supporting the TTA team as a program advisor, and uh, I have a uh, lot of experience and history with uh, SPI, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit later. Um, uh, I joined C uh, CNA about six months ago, and in my previous life, I was a university professor, and that's how I was originally introduced to uh, CNA and SPI in particular. So congratulations on your award, and I look forward to working with you throughout the next several years. Chris? Thanks. Thanks, Ken. Chip, we're just wrapping up introductions. I gave you a brief introduction, but I don't know if there's anything you wanted to say. Yes, I made it just in time. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. So I'll just say, uh, number one, I've been a recovering academic for much longer than Ken has. I uh, came to CNA about 13 or 14 years ago, actually just about when SPI began. So I've um, been working with Chris and Kate and BJA on smart policing for better part of a decade and more. And uh, it's still a very, very exciting and innovative project. And I'm thrilled to be here on this call with everybody. Let's just get moving along. Thanks, Chris. Great. Thank you, Chip. All right. So just briefly wanted to go over the agenda of what we'll be talking about today. Um, you'll hear a little bit of a background about uh, the Office of Justice Programs, BJA, as well as the SPI, how we work as a team and as how we work as a team supporting you as grantees. Uh, we'll also have a pretty good overview of both uh, the program and just grants, um, talk some in depth about grants management, as well as provide a just grants demo and the resources that are available to you. Uh, we'll also wrap up with kind of next steps for you as a site and then both throughout and then at the end, we're happy to take any questions that you may have about SPI or how, how to administer your, your grant award. Kate? I think I'm passing it over to you for the next couple slides. You sure are. Thanks, Chris, and good afternoon again, everybody. Um, we just wanted to give you a big, just a brief overview of who we are as an agency. Um, BJA is housed within the Office of Justice Programs, which is the part of the Department of Justice ded dedicated to the support of the state and local criminal justice communities along with the Office on Violence Against Women and the COPS Office. Next slide, please. So BJA was created in 1984 to reduce violent crime, create safer communities, and to reform our nation's criminal justice system. We are led by Director Carlton F. Moore, who was nominated to this position by President Biden. We work to provide policy guidance, best practices, uh, grant resources and training and technical assistance to state, local and tribal communities to reduce crime and recidivism and unnecessary confinement while promoting safe and fair criminal justice systems. Um, you can learn more about our other programs and resources. We do a whole lot. We span the criminal justice system um, in, in all of its, its uh, you know, different sectors um, at bja.gov. Next slide, please. So how do we do this? Um, we, we invest in the development of new approaches like what you all are doing under SPI. Uh, then we share what we learn. We create toolkits and other products to make it easier for the field to adopt new approaches and improve their work. And we are major conveners of criminal justice actors and thought leaders with the goal of generating new ideas and forecasting needs. Next slide, please. 
so we're messing around with polls in our some of, in some of our uh, PowerPoints now, uh, just to keep things interesting. So we have a poll here for you. So to level set, um, has your organization been awarded federal grants in the past? You could choose your response. So Chris isn't going to come up with like a result or something for me. <laughs> yes, we're going to leave it open. Folks are going to say yes. Open okay. for another five or ten seconds, and then we'll close it down and share the results. Got it. See, we're all learning together, you guys. All right, Amana. I think we're good to share. Okay, so most of you have. That's good to know, um, actually. And um, for those of you who are, who, are um, who have limited experience, um, then you are in the right spot. Um, you know, we're going to be featuring all of the resources that you can tap into, um, as well as the point of contact for any uh, questions you might have. Um, so great, we have we have a very, fairly well-rounded group, um, and we always love newbies. So welcome to all. So whether you are new or a veteran uh, to BJA, um, you have a team of folks standing by to help you be successful. Next slide, please. And SPI projects follow a pretty typical life cycle. Um, now, of course, this got all blown out of the water with COVID, but here's hoping <laughs> this will be the life cycle of your SPI uh, award um, with your one focused on setting up shop, so to speak. Um, this is when you'll develop your action plan and that will be your most important first step beyond getting your budget cleared um, as that will solidify your project plan and release your full range of funding to support your initiatives. You will also take part in a national meeting of SPI grantees in your first year or so. We are toying with having the next grantee meeting probably in October um, of next year. So we have plenty of time to arrange it and you know you have plenty of notice. You will have plenty of notice um, on the exact dates. Uh, but that's a really you know, I, I would say that that is one of the most um, enjoyable and, 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 and things that, that the grantees that we have funded under SPI um, always give us great feedback about is that grantee national meeting where everybody can get together, especially after COVID, um, and share ideas and share their work and learn some new things um, in a new place. We don't know where that will be in October, uh, but we will keep you posted. So year two is focused on project implementation for the most part and data collection. Uh, this is when you are most likely to have a site visit from CNA or BJA to assess how things are going and determine what you need in terms of additional TPA support um, or, or anything. You know, we, we really wanna be helpful to you and remove roadblocks. Um, and be a facilitating, um, you know, resource for you. Um, and so, you know, any any visit that we plan, you know, will be will be done from that from that angle. Um, year three is focused on identifying what has worked through your experience um, in the project evaluation and determining how these practices, those that prove to be successful will be sustained beyond the life of the grant. Um, we will work with your research partner to ensure the final report on your project is informative for other departments seeking to replicate your efforts. And there are often extensions to SPI awards due to their complex nature. And we will monitor your progress and ensure the appropriate adjustments are made to support a successful outcome for your initiative. 
Next slide, please. Uh, so as an SPI award recipient, you have a robust support system in place. Uh, the BJA policy office, that's me, um, will monitor your project's implementation and ensure you have access to a broad array of technical experts at BJA and SCNA that can help you identify best practices and think through implementation challenges as you come upon them. Um, my colleagues in the BJA programs office will provide guidance and management support related to the administrative and uh, other requirements of your grant award, including grant documentation, special condition fulfillment, and regular reporting requirements. And you'll hear more about from them um, later on in this webinar. Now, CNA is BJA's training and technical assistance partner for SPI, and they will provide, and Chris will be your POC uh, for the most part for CNA, um, they will provide you with day-to-day -day support um, and fill any gaps you identify in terms of training and te technical uh, expertise and um, expert consultation needs. You'll also be uh, assigned um, an SPI uh, liaison um, who is a experienced criminal justice practitioner uh, who uh, CNA contracts with to ensure that they are um, plugged in and on call for you should you need to confer with them on anything related to your SPI project and its implementation. Next slide, please. So a little more about my shop. <clears throat> so BJ's policy office uh, provides information on criminal justice policies, especially model policies, um, training and technical assistance, uh, to the field through formal programs like smart policing, and also more generally through our publications, public engagements, and convenings of experts. A large part of my job is to gather what you and my other grant funded organizations are doing and share your activities and results with the policing field. So we do this so that all can benefit from BJ's investment in your idea, making SPI a true win-win for your agency and the law enforcement field generally. Next slide, please. So, you know, everything has tips or tricks or a hack, right? <laughs> now, um, here, here, are some, here are some hacks uh, for working successfully with BJA as the young kids would say. Do they say that? Maybe not, I don't know. My 16 year old assures me I'm uncool and I don't know anything about what the young people say. Uh, <laughs> so, but here's some, here's some tips and tricks. Uh, you know, please keep us updated on how things are going, both the wins as well as the challenges. Um, I've been managing these programs for over two decades now and I can, Say with complete confidence that things never go perfectly in such complex projects. Um, we understand this at BJA. So if things start to go off track, please just tell us as soon as possible. Um, if you're experiencing challenges or setbacks, we can help you problem solve. Um, sometimes we can bring in more resources and experts uh, into the conversation to help. Um, sometimes it just means a minor adjustment to your project timeline, or <clears throat> sometimes you just need uh, your, your leadership to be briefed on SPI and how important it is. Um, we can do that too. Uh, anything that we can do to help your, uh, help contribute to your success um, is in our lane. So, um, and, and of course, it's always better to talk through a complex issue with us so that we can advise on how to proceed rather than just sending in a grant adjustment um, and hoping for the best. You know, we can collaborate with you uh, to make sure that you're asking for the right kind of help or the right kind of adjustment um, from OJP. And BJ is a big place and we are all handling multiple por portfolios. Um, you know, uh, I think we're all doing more with less 
et cetera, et cetera. Um, we do our best, absolute best to be responsive um, and to get back to you as soon as possible. But we take absolutely no offense if you need to nudge us on a request, if you haven't heard back from us, you know, in a day or two. Um, and so now I will turn things over to my program's colleagues to discuss their roles in more depth. Thank you, Kate. So I will cover the role of the BJA program office. Uh, the role of the BJA program office is mainly uh, the program office staff is committed to ensuring that the highest level of service is provided to our grantees. We provide uh, information and assistance on a broad array of grant programs and activities that we support. We're usually your primary contact and we will guide you through our different offices and uh, the many resources that we have. So we may not know every single answer, but we will guide you to the correct place that will provide you with the response. Next, please. And we also maintain regular communication with the grant award administrator. That is uh, from the grant side, our primary contact. Uh, we provide advice and assistance on grant requirements. We oversee project spending. Uh, we look at the drawdowns and we track implementation progress. We also review your semi-annual reports uh, and we conduct monitoring. And we're always available to respond to any questions that you have. So I will turn it over back to Chris for the next section. Thank you, Amy. And yes, uh, Kate gave a brief overview of the role of training and technical assistance. And our goal is to help you develop and implement your SPI initiative as successfully as we can and uh, you know, get a rigorous evaluation uh, <clears throat> for you all. Um, some of the ways that we do it um, is that we develop a collaborative relationship with you. We help identify operational, programmatic, and evaluation needs. Uh, doing so gives you access to national subject matter experts and practitioners, like Kate mentioned, to help problem solve with you in real time. Each, each site will be assigned a su set of subject matter experts and um, supports. And then we also want to learn from you. So we want to hear about your best practices, what's working, how you can take what you're doing and help other agencies apply it to their settings. So we'll, we'll definitely be playing a role in highlighting your successes and um, getting them out into the field. With that, wanted to hand it back over to Chip, and we're going to talk now about uh, the history and some of the successes of SPI. Chip? Yes, Chris, thank you very much. <clears throat> and uh, Kate and colleagues at BJA, appreciate your introduction to this. Uh, Chris, you're gonna advance the slides for me? Excellent, thank you. So this first slide just um, explains, obviously, that uh, Smart Policing was launched in uh, 2009 with four foci, right? We wanted to improve the impact of policing strategies. We wanted to help uh, police agencies utilize their resources effectively and efficiently. A uh, very interesting desire on BJA's part to return to a prevention orientation and a community orientation in policing. And uh, there was a, a goal to improve the methodological rigor of studies in policing effectiveness. So I just want to give just a little bit of a history lesson around these points here. So if you think about it, 2009 came right after the Great Recession of 2008. I'm sure many of you remember that, but it was a time <clears throat> when policing budgets were actually shrinking quite considerably. I mean, I, I mean, I think, as I recall, probably the largest shrinkage was maybe in the range of 10 to 15 percent, but departments were feeling the pinch of the recession. And at the same time, there was some interesting research published that explained the growing complexity of policing and the many, many things that police agencies were being expected to do and to engage in while their budgets were shrinking. So, you know, to their credit, BJA picked up on this, uh, this, uh, this situation 
and this issue. And so <clears throat> they founded pol smart policing to help uh, police agencies, as Kate said earlier, learn to do more of less and get a handle not only on how to manage things effectively, but how to manage things effectively and still have the impact that is expected of them by their communities and their constituents. And it is true, uh, Mike Medaris, who was the original uh, director of smart policing at BJA, he told us when we you know, originally worked on this that he had a strong desire to get back to crime prevention. Um, he had been working on drug task forces for many years and he had been observing many agencies do the same things over and over and over again and obviously not getting many different results so he came into smart policing with a desire to change the orientation and the last thing i'll say on this point is that right at about the same time there was a very interesting article published i think it was by david weisbert and john eck um, where they had a, uh, they did a meta-analysis of over 1,000 published studies of policing effectiveness. When they looked at these, I think it was 1,035 published articles on the evaluation of policing effectiveness, they found 11, 11 that had sufficient methodological rigor to warrant confidence in the findings that the, uh, were published in the articles. That rocked me back. Back, you know, back in 2009, uh, I was surprised by that. And so there was definitely an interest in smart policing to improve this methodological river, rigor and to get these agencies much more interested and much more adept at evaluating themselves, obviously working with research partners, which is, you know, part of the uh, SPI model to do a better job of understanding the impacts of their work. So that's the brief history lesson. Let's go on. and. Um, so out of that, that focus, those foci uh, came several goals for smart policing that I can say today have held pretty strong and pretty consistent over the 14 years that we've been doing this work. So one goal is to, you know, uh, as I suggested, expand the evidence base in policing to get police agencies to rely more and more effectively on evidence-based approaches to crime. Clearly a goal. Next, um, to make better use of intelligence, crime analysis, and data from various resources that helped police departments bring a strategic focus to their work. Um, so that was clearly a goal. And um, I'd like to, to mention this, this smart policing, uh, while these awards are made to specific agencies, it's more than just the agency that gets the funding. The purpose of smart policing is to learn something from these agencies and promulgate the findings widely. So other agencies and the policing profession in general learns from the lessons we get from the research in smart policing. So uh, an ambitious goal, but to have smart policing impact and improve the state of policing practice and policing science for the benefit of the entire field. Thanks, Chris. So those are the goals. I'm going to just dip into five very quickly into five case studies around what happened with smart policing in these jurisdictions. So it'll give you something of a flavor for the kinds of things that we're learning and why there continues to be such interest in the smart policing approach. So let's start with uh, St. Louis. This is um, one of the lessons that you know when you study things rigorously you don't always find tremendous impacts and so smart policing is mindful of that uh we want to study things we want to study them carefully we don't expect that they will always be a positive finding that we will always find out that what the police do and what the police do with their communities results in tremendous reductions in crime rates or tremendous increases increases in clearance rates so part of what smart policing does is it helps us understand maybe things that we shouldn't be doing, not always, you know, what we should be doing. So St. Louis, for example, very interesting and innovative approach to the utilization of what they call the mobile surveillance trailers, MSTs, right? These were uh, cameras on trailers that they would, you know, drive around and place in various parts of the cities based on a rather sophisticated analysis of hotspots and emerging crime areas. 
And so they did, you know, something of a randomized control trial. They would place these in some places and not place them in others and evaluate the impact of this technology. So interestingly, one thing they found, and this is kind of reverberated through the field a little bit, is that when they integrated gunshot detection technology into this system, it didn't necessarily produce a lot of added benefits. So gunshot detection technology in this instance did not advance things. It did not improve things a lot. They did identify uh, what they termed, the researchers termed moderate crime reductions in the areas that were treated with these MSTs uh, within about a 500 foot radius. Right? Uh, but they were systematically observed, but they were not statistically significant. Okay. Um, let's go to Boston. This is a kind of a fun story. Boston had two bites at the apple for smart policing. The first thing they did was a very innovative approach to problem oriented policing. Uh, Anthony Braga, now with the University of Pennsylvania, was the research partner. Uh, he was up in Boston at the time at Harvard. And uh, they did a really good, you know, randomized control trial. <clears throat> with the problem oriented policing and they found significant impact significant reductions in violent crime based on these this uh, you know community integration approach interestingly they did not see any reductions in homicides as a result of the research so they applied to spi a couple of years later with a, an idea about reconstituting the entire homicide unit for the boston police department that was a significant undertaking. It took a long bit of planning, a lot of work convincing the police department to do this, but they did it. Anthony conducted a randomized trial around that and identified uh, clear reductions in homicide clearance rates based on this new model, this new approach to investigating homicides. Um, Detroit uh, instituted what uh, maybe some of you have heard of this, a, a program called Operation it's a very extensive and very interesting collaboration between the police department and local businesses, where they would invest jointly in the placement of cameras at these local business establishments. And see how much of a deterrent and how much of an aid in investigating crimes that would be. Uh, they did find <laughs> uh, declines in carjackings and other kind of moderate improvements in public safety, but uh, you know, thorough research being done by Ed McGarrell and his group out of Michigan State University. In the end, they had a difficult time attributing all of those reductions to smart policing alone because there were so many other things going on in Detroit. But I have to tell you, Operation Greenlight picked up in a big way in Detroit, and I know it was uh, translated to many other jurisdictions around the country. There's a, again, the innovative partnership between the department and uh, local, mostly small businesses in a, a joint investment in surveillance technology. That was kind of interesting. Arizona is another fun story. Uh, Mike White and his colleagues at Arizona State University convinced the Tempe Police Department to not only implement a new approach to de-escalation training, but to develop their own approach. They did it in a very innovative way. Chris, how am I doing on time? Am I okay? I got a couple more minutes here, but very innovative way to innovative approach to developing training, they had all the officers in patrol in Tempe identify the top 10 de-escalators in the department. So it was a general process where the officers ranked each other on their abilities at de-escalation. And when they identified the top 10, Mike White recruited them and worked with them to develop a de-escalation training. They traveled around the country, they visited uh, LA, and they uh, looked at the PERF curriculum that was very popular at the time. And they developed their own de-escalation training based on this modified approach, this new approach. Mike subjected that to a randomized control trial. And he found uh, several statistically significant positive impacts on um, police behavior, right? Police were less likely to use condescending or patronizing language. They were more likely to attempt to build rapport with uh, civilians, uh, more likely to resolve the encounter informally. So a number of 
positive outcomes from the uh, the training, and he um, he used body worn camera footage to conduct those evaluations. And they also found statistically significant a fifty eight percent less likelihood of civilian injury when officers trained in de-escalation you know, were handling the situations. This is a pretty cool example of not only a development initiative, but a randomized controlled trial that identified pretty conclusively that this de-escalation training was worthwhile and worth, you know, worth implementing. Uh, my last case is about Miami, Florida. Uh, this was all mostly about the uh, <clears throat> development of uh, a crime intelligence center for the Miami Police Department, but also embedding an academic criminologist in that center, pretty close to on a full-time basis, along with several students. So one of the very interesting things that came out of that work was simply a very thorough evaluation of the implementation of this technology in a large police department. They also found significant increases in clearance rates based on you know calls that were responded to with this intelligence capacity but interestingly no reduction in the length of time that it took to clear them okay so they reduced they increased the clearance rate but they were not able to reduce the time it took to get to clearance so those are five out of a number of case studies that we could talk about uh, let's go to the next, next slide so uh I'm going to say a few words just generally about what we're learning, and that's going to conclude my remarks. One of the interesting things that has, has come out of smart policing and that I've seen in smart policing more than I've seen in other research approaches in policing is the importance of measuring dosage. It's not just the implementation of an intervention, you know, in hot spots or in uh, focused deterrence or in technology. It's not just the fact of implementing, but it's measuring the extent to which the dosage is applied. So do you send one officer? Do you send three officers? Do they spend 10 minutes? Do they spend 20 minutes? Uh, Anthony Braga and his research in Boston and some of our other researchers have done a very, very good job of documenting the dosage. What exactly do police officers do when they're sent to a designated hotspot or a designated area? What do they do? How do they engage? How much time do they spend there? So we've learned an awful lot through smart policing on how to measure the dosage of interventions. I think that's a refinement that's uh, sig sig significant. I'm a little proud of the fact that we, we did coin this phrase, I think, at least in my little circle of people, of inreach. There's always an awful lot of talk about the importance of outreach and community policing and policing generally and engaging with community and engaging with stakeholders and making sure everybody understands what you're doing and why you're doing it and how you're doing it. Times we have learned in smart policing sites that the in reach doing those same things with the entire department that you're working in is also important. It was, I mean, in, in, in the early days, it was possible to run a smart policing project for three years and have not many people inside that department even know what it was. So we ended up working a lot. I'm going to credit Nola Joyce with uh, some of this work. We learned an awful lot about marketing and delivering and letting everybody know in your unit, in your detective unit, in your crime analysis unit, Everybody should know internal to your organization what you're doing and why you're doing it. That will help with this huge issue that we are always concerned with in smart policing called sustainability. If things are working well, if the research and the data are showing that there are results that are worth paying attention to here, how do we keep it going? And so that's a uh, problem of the decade, problem of the century, but we do focus a lot in smart policing on sustainability. So we preach about planning for, for sustainability at day one, not waiting for a year and a half for the research findings to come out right away. Uh, we've also, I'm going to say, have done a fair amount of innovative work around community engagement and community collaboration. 
you will find as you go along in your work that there's a, a number of resources to draw from in smart policing about engaging in communities and engaging in communities that uh, suffer the most and have the most negative experiences, not only with police, but with violent crime and with harm. So we learned an awful lot about collaboration under smart policing. Learned an awful lot about the importance of building internal crime analysis capacity. Research partners from external organizations and universities are wonderful things. It's very important that there's an integration of the research partner and the crime analysis unit. And there is no crime analysis unit, or it's underfunded and understaffed, helping the police department build that capacity. That contributes to sustainability as well. And the last point I'll make is um, when you conduct this research with your research partners very thoroughly, looking at both implementation and process evaluations and outcome and impact evaluations, you a lot. It's very helpful. Even if the implementation, even if the treatment fails and doesn't produce significant downturns in crime, there's an awful lot that's learned through these approaches. Let me end on this note. Um, uh, I'm going to repeat something Kate said earlier. She made a comment about how things rarely go perfectly. I want to echo that. We've worked with, what, Chris, almost 90 police departments now over the you know, 15 years. The best funded, the smartest, the best supported departments with the top notch researchers in the country. Everybody encounters challenges during the three year implementation of a complex program like smart policing, a complex initiative. So uh, it's best to stay in communication with us as you go along. You'll have many opportunities to communicate and to talk. CNA can and will help you. And I wanna stress that our orientation to technical assistance, you probably heard this before, is in being helpful. There's very, very few things that BJA makes you do under smart policing. There's a ton of opportunity to get help and get assistance learn from others, get support that you need along the way. And we take this very, very seriously. So we want to help. Please stay in contact with us as you go along. And uh, I'll end with that, Chris. And I think we have a stop and talk if anybody wants to ask any questions right now. We do, I believe, Sybil Brownfield had a question. Do you want to go ahead and unmute your, you're able to speak. Yes, I was just, I wanted to confirm that a copy of the webinar would be posted. Yes. So after the event, the recording and the slides will be posted. Um, I will also send out um, the slides immediately after this uh, webinar. Uh, it usually takes us a little extra time to edit down the, the webinar itself. So you'll receive a copy right after the event. Thanks so much. Any other questions? All right. If you have any in the in the coming slides, please do just type them in. We're happy to answer them as we receive them. And there'll be other opportunities like this one to, to stop and talk. Kim, I think you're up next. Sure, thanks, Chris. Um, I want to talk a few minutes about uh, training and technical assistance and CNA's approach uh, to TTA. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the hallmarks of the SPI program um, has been the coordination of training and technical assistance that awardees can leverage throughout the program. CNA is responsible for coordinating these TTA opportunities to SPI sites. And our approach has always been that of uh, collaboration and relationship building. Uh, your TTA site team, which I'll talk about here momentarily, is interested in understanding your departments, uh, your problems, your organization's culture, uh, your strengths, and quite frankly, your challenges. Uh, the team will be able uh, to provide suggestions 
talk through issues and engage in real time problem solving with you. Um, but this relationship is not directive. Uh, the team is not there to tell you what to do, uh, largely because you are the subject matter experts on your community. Uh, the team is interested in working with you to identify steps for your short, medium and long term success. And we're interested in working with you to accomplish measurable outcomes uh, that that enhance public safety in your cities. So I, I do want to say that I, I have a unique engagement with SPI, and I speak to you uh, today from a position of experience. Uh, I've been involved with SPI in one way, shape, or form since 2013 uh, from a couple different angles. Uh, I was a research partner on two separate SPI awards, and since 2019, uh, I have served as a subject matter expert on TTA teams for five different SPI sites. And today, uh, I'm serving SPI as a uh, CNA employee. Uh, so I've been a TTA recipient, coordinator, and provider. So perhaps uh, better than many people on this call, I know what you're going through. I know what's ahead for you. And because of that, you have uh, my respect and my support. My best advice would be to echo a couple things that you know Chip and Kate have both said. Don't hesitate for ask, to ask for help. Uh, the TTA team is interested in your success, and that's our job to uh, try to guide your team to success. Next slide, please. Um, so how do we do this? Each uh, SPI site will be assigned a TTA team, uh, and this will consist of a uh, practitioner subject expert, a research expert, and a CNA operations analyst. Each team member brings a different skill set to the table, including a seasoned policing professional, an action researcher, uh, and a CNA specialist who coordinates all of these activities throughout your award. We're currently identifying uh, the team based on our understanding of your site, your problems, your project's goals, uh, and the team will work uh, with you in this collaborative manner from action plan through to final report. Uh, together, you and your TTA team will identify challenges and TTA needs, and the TTA uh, team will advocate on your behalf to leverage additional assistance to enhance your success. Uh, throughout the project, we'll identify success stories and uh, make sure those are highlighted to both BJA as well as other SPI sites. So TTA is available throughout the life of the grant, um, and your TTA may look different uh, over time because your project will evolve uh, over time. So therefore, training and technical assistance will evolve with you. Uh, the initial phase is action planning, and this is something Kate was mentioning earlier. Uh, the action plan is essentially a strategic plan for full project implementation. Uh, much of this is started probably with your proposal, uh, and this proposal that you submitted for your award uh, will likely serve as a foundation for your action plan. Uh, but in the first couple months, we're going to ask you to reassess where you are and reevaluate your capacities, and action plans are just much more detailed versions of your grant proposal. It basically puts meat on the bones and uh, provides a space for your team to articulate activities, key personnel, timelines, logic models, and expected outcomes. Uh, while the site team will produce the action plan, CNA will be available for consultation and recommendations before submission and review by BJA. Uh, after your action plan is approved, we'll move, uh, provide guidance of moving that plan into practice. Uh, the team will meet monthly uh, with the, uh, each site to identify accomplishments, identify barriers to success, and identify evolving TTA needs that may not be apparent uh, today. Uh, SPI projects tend to evolve, and so too will your needs. Uh, we can deliver additional training in-house, but more likely than not, we'll uh, work to connect your site uh, with others for peer exchanges of information. Uh, as noted earlier, the SPI alumni network is quite large, and while each city is in fact unique, there's a decent chance that uh, some of the challenges that your site uh, confronts 
will have been uh, addressed by or experienced by uh, other sites that have had SPI uh, awards. Peer exchange for TTA is a great opportunity to harness the power and expertise of the SPI network of professionals, saving you time and avoiding frustration. Uh, your site will finally uh, produce a final report uh, as part of your closeout for the grant. Uh, your TTA team will work with you to review this report and provide guidance based on our experience working with other sites and our understanding of BJA's broader expectations. Again, uh, TTA here is designed to enhance success. So I think we're up against another uh, break here to stop and talk. And Chris, I don't know if now is a good time to just ask if there's any additional questions, maybe TTA specific questions. Yes, that would be good, Ken, before we transition to some of the programs discussion. All right. Feel, please feel free to type in any questions as we get through the, the conversation. Um, Amy, am I passing it off to you to start talking about uh, the programs? Yes. OK, it's all yours. OK, so Kisley and I will give you an overview on the grants management requirements and everything that you need to do to manage your new SBI award. Next, please. Um, OJP is authorized to distribute funds to support project designated uh, projects designated to improve the functioning of the criminal justice system. Funding for the SBI program is under the Bayern Discretionary Grants. And if you're interested to know where the funding comes and to learn more about the Consolidated Appropriations Act, here we have a lot of information for you. Next slide, please. In FY23, BJA funded 10 awards in 10 different states, South Carolina, Nevada, Oregon, Colorado, New Hampshire, Illinois, Indiana, Washington, Florida, and Arizona. Awards range from five, uh, 537,000 to 800,000. Currently, we have 36 active SBI awards. I am the grant manager for the awards highlighted in yellow. I'm sorry, I'm the grant manager for the awards highlighted in green, and Gisla is the grant manager uh, for the awards highlighted in yellow. Uh, and that is also noted in Just Grants. When you go to your homepage in Just Grants, you will see on the right hand side your assigned grant manager with our email and our phone number listed right below our names. Your programs were funded for different objectives that include uh, reducing violent crime, reducing vehicle thefts and property crime, developing tools to conduct analyses of different variables. Uh, many of you are implementing new ev evidence-based programming, increasing capacity, and sustaining community safety by advancing the state of policing practice and science. So all your programs have different objectives. Next, please. The role of the BJA Programs Office team, um, Gisela and I provide assistance on a number of things, uh, starting with accepting your award, accessing funds, staying in compliance with award conditions, and that is a very important one because that really uh, releases the funds uh, for you to be able to uh, meet your objectives. Also reviewing and approving performance reports. So we are the ones that read your, uh, your performance reports and communicate uh, with Kate uh, at the policy office if we have any concerns or questions. Uh, we also provide assistance with grant award modifications if any changes are needed during the life of your grant. And we also conduct the close out process and can provide you assistance closing out your grant at the very end. Next, please. We work closely with the Office of the Chief Financial Officer, OCFO. They provide financial guidance, including the budget clearance, 
reviewing budget modifications. We collaborate and work very closely on budget modifications. Also, they provide assistance with financial questions um, and specific questions about the FFRs, financial reporting. They also conduct uh, financial monitoring uh, that can be done remotely. And sometimes they also do in-person monitoring and conduct the financial closeout at the end of your award. Next slide, please. Grantees have different roles in just grants. As you become familiar with the system, uh, you will see that there are uh, multiple roles that you can have in just grants. And that include the entity administrator, the grant award administrator, authorized representative, and the financial manager. And under each role, you can do different things in Just Grants. Uh, so our primary contact is the grant award administrator. So that's the person that we at BJA call when we have questions or we need information. We always contact the grant award administrator first. An individual can have multiple roles in Just Grants. The entity administrator assigns the roles in Just Grants. So that is the only person that could change roles. Uh, if there is new staff, they could assign a, a role to that new staff. So only the entity administrator can assign the roles. The authorized representative accepts the award, and, it's the, and, and that person is the legal authority of the project. Um, if there is, for example, a no-cost extension request, it has to be signed by the authorized representative. The grant award administrator submits programmatic reports and uh, any grant award modifications, and that person uh, should know the day-to-day -day operations of the SPI program if possible. The financial manager submits the federal financial report known as the FFR. So for example, the financial manager cannot submit performance reports. That person can only submit the financial reports. Next slide, please. Grants management overview. One more, next please. So here we have a graphic of the grant management award cycle. The first step is to accept your award in order to access your funds. We have to resolve any award conditions, ensure your budget has been approved, uh, also submitting performance reports and financial reports during the life of the award. Uh, you may need to submit a grant award modification if some of the line items in your budget have changed in year two or year three. Uh, also, BJA may monitor your award from the programmatic side or the financial side. And the final step is closeout. We will review each of these steps in a lot of detail. Next slide, please. Award acceptance. Again, only the authorized representative can accept the award and that is done electronically in the Just Grant system. The award agreement is a legally binding contract with the government. Please ensure you have accepted your award in Just Grants. If you haven't done that yet, it's very important that you accept your award. A training video and guidance is available that shows, uh, shows you step-by-step -step how to do it, how to accept your award. The training link is on this slide. Uh, if you have any questions or you're having any issues, please contact your grant manager. Next slide, please. So prior to accepting your award, the entity administrator must assign the grant award administrator role and the financial manager role. So those two roles have to be assigned in order to accept your award. And you also have to confirm the authorized representative. If the authorized representative needs to be changed, if uh, you included somebody else during the grant application process, and now 
that person is no longer in the program and that person has to be changed, the entity administrator can register the new person. And uh, we have guidance on the second box on how to do that. We actually have links on this slide that could guide you again, step-by-step step on each step of the process. Please ensure that you have the correct role in Just Friends. Uh, if there are changes during the life of the award, uh, and we know staff change throughout the grant, the entity administrator can change the roles at any time. So uh, if next year you have new, a new financial manager, the entity administrator could make that change. And once the authorized representative is confirmed, the award will be uh, in that person's work list in Just Grants, and it will be ready to be accepted. So after your award is accepted, the status of your award will change in Just Grants to pending active. Uh, and we can walk you through this process if you're having any challenges accepting your award or assigning roles. Next slide, please. Accessing funds. Uh, to access your grant funds, the award has to be accepted. Your entity must be registered in the ASAP system. That is the system that we use for drawdowns. If your grant application was complete, uh, you should have 10% of the funding available as soon as you set up your ASAP account and accept your award. So you should have 10% ready to be used uh, now. When your budget is approved by OCFO, you will have 250,000 available for use on planning and uh, to work on your action plan. To access the rest of the funding, the strategic plan must be approved by the policy office, and that is Kate. So CNA and Kate work together uh, on providing the final approval for your action plan. All performance reports and final reports must be completed. If you have delinquent reports, you may not be able to access your funds. So if you see your award, uh, the status as uh, suspend the status, most likely it is because there is a condition that hasn't been resolved or uh, there are some delinquent reports. Next slide, please. Accessing funds with ASAP. If you had an OJP award in the past and have an ASAP account, you do not need to do anything else unless another user has to be added. If this is your very first award with OJP, the entity administrator listed in your in just grants should have received two emails from ASAP to begin the registration process. If you need the emails to be resent to you, please contact OCFO. Uh, customer service and their phone number and email is on this slide. Uh, OCFO customer service can help you uh, get set up with ASAP. And the graphic on this slide shows the process to get reimbursed. The first step is to enroll at ASAP.gov. OJP will add the funding to your ASAP account. You have to request payment via ASAP.gov to be reimbursed. After approval, payments can settle as quickly as the same day. So once you're set and, and, and everything is approved, uh, your payments could be uh, received that same day. Please contact OCFO again if you have questions uh, with ASAP registration or anything related to ASAP. And do I have a question, Chris? I think I saw a question coming. Because I'll I'll go I'll do a few more slides before questions. Okay. Okay. Next slide, please. Award conditions. Um, grantees are responsible for adhering to all applicable award conditions. Uh, and there are a lot of conditions uh, on your on your award. 
most SPI awardees have over 50 conditions. Uh, and 31 are standard conditions for all OJP awardees. So they're the same for all awardees across the board. Um, but please pay attention to any conditions that are holding the funds. Review all of the conditions in Chess Grants, especially the very last conditions. Those are the ones that usually are very specific to your program and, are sh and show the withholding and how much funding is being withheld with each condition. So please, it's very important that you review the conditions. And if you have any questions about any withholdings, contact, uh, contact me or contact Isla. Next slide, please. Withholdings. Uh, you have a condition for the SPI action plan. That will be removed when the plan is approved by the policy office. Most common withholding conditions are for missing or insufficient application information. For example, if you have indirect cost in your budget and you're missing the indirect cost agreement or it's expired, uh, we may have added a condition for that. Or if your budget needs to be revised, due to unallowable equipment, uh, we probably um, added a condition for that. So you will see that these conditions hold funding. So we need to address the conditions uh, to ensure that all of your funding is available. Okay. Budget clearance. Uh, budget clearance is the approval of your budget. So your budget was not approved prior to award notification. The budget clearance grant award uh, modification, we call again the grant award modification, is initiated in just grants by OCFO. If the budget is fine and there are no questions, uh, OCFO doesn't have any issues with the budget, they will approve the budget right away and we will release that condition uh, and we will uh, lift the, the, the withholding, so you will have the funds available. But if revisions are needed uh, to your budget, OCFO will send the grant award administrator a change request with the specific instructions. For example, if your budget was included, uh, if, in your, if in your budget uh, there was included a contracted position as personnel, they will ask you to move that contracted position under contracts, or they will tell you specifically uh, what needs to be done to correct your budget. Or if something is not adding up, sometimes all the costs are fine, but the total is just not adding up. So they will let you know exactly what they would like you to revise. Uh, if you receive a change request, please make the revision as soon as possible and resubmit the GAM to ju in just grants. So this has to be done in just grants. Uh, when the budget is approved by OCFO, the condition will be resolved and the withholding of funds will be lifted and you will have 250,000 available in your budget uh, until the SBI action plan is approved. But once your budget is approved, uh, you will get two hundred and fifty thousand uh, in your ASAP account. Okay, I could take questions, Chris. Sure. Um, not seeing anything here. I, Amada did put in uh, one of the links uh, from one of your slides, but not seeing anybody hand raised right now. Okay. Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, allowable costs. All costs must be allowable, reasonable, allocable, and necessary to the project. And you will hear us say this over and over again. Uh, any costs incurred outside the project period are unallowable. So your award ends on September 30, 2026. Any expenses incurred after that date are unallowable unless you have an approved extension. Uh, but otherwise, those expenses are not allowable. 
any security enhancements or equipment to any non-governmental entity that is not engaged in criminal justice or public safety is unallowable. Other unallowable costs include uh, lobbying, fundraising, U, uh, UAVs, or any type of drones are not allowable, uh, food and beverages, gift cards, prices, rewards, or monetary incentives are not allowable with SPI funding. Uh, any supplanting of funds, for example, uh, if you cannot, you cannot pay a salary that with this grant that it's already been paid with another source of local funding for the same exact activities. So you cannot supplant. Uh, this year we have new prohibited and controlled equipment. This is new and I will review that. Next slide, please. Prohibited equipment includes uh, firearms and ammunition of more than 50 caliber, firearms silencers, grenades and launchers, explosives, any vehicles that do not have a commercial application. And we have a link on this slide that gives you a lot of detail and specifics. But if you have a question about a specific item, please let us know. So these items are not allowable. Uh, next slide, please. Additional prohibited items are unmanned aerial systems, weapon systems covered by DOD, aircraft, uh, vessels, and vehicles of any kind are not allowable. Uh, long range acoustic devices without a commercial application, camouflage pattern uniforms, uh, all of these are not allowable with SBI funding. Next slide, please. Controlled equipment. So OJP has controlled uh, the use of funds to purchase or transfer uh, the following equipment. So these need a special permission, a special approval. So you're able to fund some of these, but uh, you have to request the special approval to purchase these items. Uh, and that includes command or control vehicles for the purpose of public safety, tactical vehicles, specialized firearms under 50 caliber. And some of these don't apply to your SBI program. And if they're not already in your budget, I would recommend that you do not add any of these uh, if they don't pertain to your actual SBI objectives. This is just new regulations that we received this year on funding that uh, it is not allowable or needs uh, additional approval. And there are other costs that require prior approval, and that includes compensation for consultant services over the daily rate of 650 or 81.25 per hour. So you're not able to pay consultants more than 650 per day uh, without uh, special approval. If you will be publishing information related to this SPI program, please contact Kate at the policy office uh, to seek approval. Let us know, you can contact us and we will get in touch with Kate. Uh, if you will be funding SAB awards, any costs prior to the SAB award date need approval. So if you signed a SAB award agreement today and they were already expenditures, we, you need approval in order to get those paid. And foreign travel, that doesn't apply really to SPI. Next slide, please. Grant financial management training. Uh, the grant award administrator and the financial manager assigned to your award must complete the training. It is a lengthy online training, around 12 modules. It does take some time to complete, but the training is valid for three years, and it's valid for any OJP award that you may receive. 
please follow the link on this slide to complete your training. Uh, and when you have your certificate of completion, please send us an email with your certificate. Um, and that is uh, to your brand manager, that's Gisla or I. Now I will pass it over to Gisla to cover the procurement overview. Thank you. Hi, this is Gisela. Um, I will be conducting the rest of the um, grant management um, overview. Start with the procurement overview. <clears throat> um, for uh, procurement, all procurement transactions must be conducted in a manner which is um, a free competitive um, form or um, open and transparent. Um, the grantees should um, follow their local and state guidelines for procurement. Um, there is one exception of a um, competitive procurement, which is sole source. Um, BJA is not a big supporter of sole source, but if um, anything over $250,000 must be approved by BJA um, before you can do in, um, a sole source contract. Um, if it's under 250,000, you must follow your procurement guidelines. If you do not have procurement guidelines, then you must follow the OJP financial guide um, requirements. But we really um, try to encourage everyone to um, send out all their um, contracts um, in a competitive form. Next slide. Um, subcontracts and procurement contracts. Um, in the past, this has caused a lot of confusion um, with grant manage uh, with um, grantees on the difference. A subcontract is a contract that you have with someone that's going to help you um, accomplish the goals of your um, project. Um, all of our um, programs have subcontracts because you're going to have some type of research component. So your contract with that research component will be considered a subcontract and we have to be treated as a subcontract. Procurement contract is um, a contract to obtain goods and services. For instance, you may do a contract with a company just throwing something out for um, shop spotters. You're going to have to buy the equipment for that. So that's considered a procurement contract. Um, the shop spotter itself is not going to do the work to help you accomplish the goal, but it is a vessel that you're going to use along with the researcher to accomplish your goal. Um, if you have any questions about subcontracts, subawards, or procurement contracts, please feel free to reach out to Amy or myself, and we can help you distinguish whether um, the contract that you're doing is a subaward or a procurement co um, contract. Next slide, please. Okay, now we have a polling question. Chris, or do you have a poll ready for? And we're basically just asking, trying to get an idea of how many people will be um, will be creating a sub awards or procurement contract or both or neither. Um, but I think we should at least have a hundred percent of sub awards. Let me go, Gisela. Okay. Oh, the 57%. Um, so those of you that are not, that did not check sub awards, just reach out to Amy or myself to make sure that um, you are following the correct procedure. Because if you have a research partner, there should be a sub award somewhere within um, your budget. Okay, the administrative um, sub awards. 
also was under the federal award requires prior approval. Um, the specifics of award was in, that's in your budget is to assure that the award approval for that sub award, sub awards not included or specific to the application must be approved um, via a GAM, a grant, a grant award modification. Grantee recipient serve, well, the pass-throughs does not really pertain to this. This is really for grantees that have JAG awards. Next slide, please. The administrator with the FAFADA reporting on several awards, it's important that you are that you mark that you know if you're doing a sub award. So that's why I stress that if you're doing anything that you think is um, procurement and not sub award, please talk to Amy or myself because a sub award over thirty thousand dollars has to be reported to the uh, FAFADA website for transparency. So if there's, we do have a link that's on here. But if you have any questions or concern on whether the awards, and I think a question just popped up, that the awards that you're making, whether they are sub-awards or procurement contracts, please reach out to your grant, your grant manager. Um, Chris, do we want to address that question or do we want to wait until the sure, end? Sure, if you can, real quick. Okay. Um, I don't have a look. Can you read it to me, please? Okay. Uh, it says reference uh, the $250,000 threshold. Is that for the life of the award or is that $250,000 per year? That's for the life of the award. It's, um, yeah, your, your sole source, anything over 250000 whether it's the first year or the third year, has to um, be approved. And that 250,000 is only for the sole source. So it's the, I just wanna make sure they're not confusing that 250,000 to the 250 that Amy spoke of earlier that helps with the action plan. Great, thank you, Gisela. And one quick update for the attendees. Uh, it looks like we're gonna be running a little bit over to make sure we get through all of the slides today. Um, if uh, Know that the webinar is going to be recorded if you want to touch base on any of these specifics related to um, the programs and then the next steps for SPI. All good, Gisela. Back okay, to you. next slide. And I would try to talk a little faster. Um, your procurement contracts, as we discussed earlier, um, Procurement contracts is for goods and services where your sub awards is for the entity or organization that's going to help you complete the goal. Um, we do have the um, FARS information, so that will help you um, with the definitions of the procurement contracts. But like I said, if you have any more questions, please contact your grant manager. Okay, next award. Okay, NEPA, I really don't think this is going to pertain to any of our grants. Um, if it does, it would be because someone is doing something with DNA or chemical testing. Um, you should look at your um, award conditions. If you have a NEPA award condition, reach out to Amy or myself, and we can um, help you along with the steps to take to get your NEPA approved. Um, but as far as these grants, I don't think that they're going to affect any of these grants. Next slide. And um, we could just go to the next slide because I don't think this is for us. Um, and then the next one. Okay, body worn camera policy. Um, we do have some awards. I don't know if it's in this group of 10. Um, if you're doing anything with body-worn cameras um, in your SPI program, um, we need you to fill out your certification. Plus, you, have to, you should have um, agency policy on body-worn camera. We will need a copy of your policy, and we will need a copy of the certification signed by your sheriff or your chief um, 
on um, to certify that you do have policies in place um, before we could release funds for you to um, implement implement your program using by the one cameras. Next slide. Okay, there are other administrative uh, requirements, um, but not limited to the um, DOJ grants financial guide. Um, please, all the financial people, um, what I would like to say, whoever you have in just grants as your financial person, please let them be the individuals that's actually working in the finance office for your city or county. Your financial person should be the, the individual that's actually cutting the checks, that's actually making the payments. Um, they need to um, ensure that everything that's done is within the financial guide. Um, sustainability um, and interaction participating minors, I don't think we have any of that in our programs. But if you're doing anything that's uh, working with minors or uh, that's involving minors in your program, please just reach out to Amy or myself. But the financial guide for your finance person, even the grant manager, please set it as a um, desktop application and always reference back to it. Next slide. Administrative payments and drawdowns. Amy covered this earlier. Um, make sure when you do your drawdowns, you're doing the drawdowns within 10 days of when the payments are going to be are going to be made. That's why it's important that your financial office is listed as a financial person in just grants and that they are the one that's doing the drawdown. They know when payments go out. Um, having payments, having funds in your account over 10 days, um, that's a red flag. That's considered excess fund on hand and that can get you in trouble. And when you do draw down, make sure you're only drawing down the amount of money that you spent for that period, which should also reflect the amount of money that you um, put on your FFR at the end of each quarter. Next slide. Um, the financial management system. Um, this is really more when we do a visit, your accounting system, um, your um, project cost budget accounting system. We just need to make sure that your system is able to track down all of your costs, starting with your budget. It's to track what's being obligated, what's actually been expended, and that um, it also shows um, which you receive. And it will help the accounting funds. Um, we want to make sure that each grant has a different account. Um, we cannot commingle accounts. Um, that will be a, a major finding. Um, next slide. So um, the uh, features um, of an um, adequate accounting system, it meets the requirement for um, per periodic um, reporting. There may be times where we may have to reach out and ask for a general ledger for a particular uh, period. Usually we work in quarters. Your system would need to um, be able to pull that, that information and give it to us. Um, there may be times where we might ask for, you might purchase something and you have to do inventory, which is part of property control. Your system needs to be able to reflect, reflect um, any inventory or any equipment that you have listed. Um, your system should be able to track all receipts separately, all expenditures, assets, liabilities. So if I request a copy of, you know, I just want your expenditures for the quarter. You should be able to pull a report just to show that one particular thing. So to go back to, like I said earlier, make sure that your person that's in Just Grants is your true financial person. Next, next slide. 
Okay, recipients and subrecipients are prohibited from commingling funds. Um, I've had this to happen a couple of times where your a, a, a agency will have three BJA grants or will have grants from three different um, a, um, government agencies and all the drawdowns are put into one account. And when we ask um, for a report, the report, they cannot show us what was drawn down or what was spent on our particular grant because everything is in one big one big account. That's considered commingling. Um, if we come out for a site visit and this is discovered, that's an automatic write-up. Um, and it could cause for um, OCFO, our finance office, to come and do a financial um, site visit um, to check your systems, which could cause other problems, and you might end up with an OIG visit. So um, we just want to be careful we do not commingle funds. Next slide. And I know I'm talking fast, so um, but if you have any questions or if you're not understanding anything I'm saying, please feel free to reach out to me. Okay, when do I report? This is key. I need everyone to print this slide out. Besides the financial guide, that's number one. This is number two. Please print this out. Your FFRs, your financial status reports, they are due every quarter. They are due from October, from the 1st to the 31st of each quarter, except for June and September is the 30th. But at the end of each quarter, you have 30 days to submit. So please, please print this out and keep it. Because we have, if your um, reports are one day late, your funds are frozen. And we get a lot of calls. We can't draw down because your reports are not in. Your performance reports, that's the programmatic report. You first have to go into, and we probably need to switch the um, switch the slides. Um, the BJA performance measures, that should be number two because you do that every quarter. Every quarter you fill out the performance measure reports. Every six months, you upload your two quarters of form performance measure reports into Just Grants and submit that as the semi-annual report. It causes a lot of confusion. So the performance measure reports are done every quarter. Once you do it, we ask you to download it and save it on your computer. At the end of the each six months, you take your, let's say, October through December, January to March, and then you upload it into Just Grants. Uh, we get a lot of delinquent reports, or we get a lot of reports submitted in Just Grants, but it only has one quarter, and it doesn't, and it's missing the second quarter. So um, if you forget, or if you're not sure, just reach out to us before you submit your performance performance report. But um, your performance report, if that's delinquent, it can also freeze your funds. Um, next slide. Okay, reporting tips. Um, report funds that are obligated in the, um, report funds in expenditures, not drawdown amounts. Like I said earlier, Anytime you obligate anything or expend any funds, that should be reported on your financial status report. Um, you don't report your drawdowns. We can see what you've drawn down. That's how we can tell if you got excess funds or not. Or we can also tell if you're not drawn down in enough money. So please make sure that you, um, you know, just look at these slides and make sure you're reporting everything correctly and report the cumulative amounts every year. I mean, I'm sorry, every quarter, not just what you spend on um, during that quarter. Um, your financial person will be, because I think the majority of the individuals on this call are the agencies 
they've had prior grants. Your financial person will be able to fill this out completely. And for your um, performance reports, like I said, if you just attach your two um, PMT reports to your performance report and just grants every six, six months, you should be okay. Next slide. Okay, um, grant modifications are GAMs, well, grant award modifications are GAMs. There are two types of GAMs that you can submit. You have your programmatic GAM, which is a scope change, or um, it could be a no-cost extension um, GAM um, that you can submit. We also have um, a program office approval GAM, which is not changing the scope. Um, it's not changing the date, but it could be you want to change your researcher from one um, research or one university to another, that's a program office approval GAM. So if you're not sure on what type of GAM to submit, just reach out to Amy or myself. Your financial GAMs is your budget clearance GAM, which is sent to you um, if you have any um, corrections on your budget that need to, to be addressed. If you're doing a budget modification, um, if you want to change something on your um, budget, um, you will submit a budget GAM. Um, the 10% funds is 10% within the particular category or categories that have always that have already been approved for um, with money in it. If you submit, if your original budget has nothing in supplies, but you realize, oh, we need to put money in supplies. Because supplies was approved for zero dollars, you have to send a budget modification GAM in order to move money into that category. If you're moving money from personnel to travel, but you already have money in both of those categories, as long as it's under 10% of the entire award, then you can make that move. Usually we would ask that you contact us uh, and let us know what you're doing. Um, sometimes your grant manager might even ask if you just submit a budget, um, I mean, I'm sorry, a program office approval game. That's just documentation that you have notified BJA of this move. It's safe to do that because sometimes personnel leave. We might leave or someone on your end leaves. We have record that there was actual communication about that 10% move. Um, so source, that's, um, we have to get that approved. So that will also be a financial gain. Um, next, next slide. Okay, project period extension. Um, it must be requested through Just Grants at least 30 days prior to the end date. Um, one thing about that, we, for Just Grants, the system will lock up where you cannot submit it. After 30 days, you will have to send everything to the grant manager and we will have to actually create the GAM. Um, how I usually handle my GAMs. If you're near the end of your um, your award period and you feel that you're gonna need a GAM, I usually ask to send 60 days, 60 to 30 days before the end of the um, award period. That would give us time, because usually by the time the awards end, we're processing new awards. So it, to keep us from missing a GAM, if you could send it 60 days prior, um, that would be great. And just in case we have questions and you need to go back and modify something, that would give us time. And your extension cannot be more than 12 months. We will only approve 12 month um, project period extensions. Uh, next slide. Okay, in-depth monitoring. We as grant managers in OJP, we are uh, required to monitor at least 10% of our active grants each fiscal year. 
Um, depends on what office you're in. You might not, you only, may only monitor three. BJA, we have to beg for mercy. So this year we're monitoring 12. It's been up to 15. So you may, as a 2023 recipient, you probably won't get a request from Amy or myself. A year or two from now, we may send you a letter and say, congratulations, you've been chosen to be monitored. Um, we will give you all your instructions. We ask that we get full participation from the recipients of the award, not participate in not having key personnel there, not responding to our monitoring letters, could be considered a finding, it could, could be considered a write-up, and it could possibly put you on a high-risk list. Our monitors could be, monitoring could be via WebEx, which is remotely, or it could be on-site. Um, as I tell my grantees, we are not auditors. We are not here to try to find something wrong. Our monitoring visits is our friendly visits. We want to ensure that you are in compliance and you're doing everything right so you won't get in trouble. My motto is, if you look good, we look good. So when you get your, if, if you give a letter saying you're going to be monitored, don't be nervous, don't be scared. We are coming as your friend just to ensure everything is up to date and on par. Next slide. Okay, common areas of non-compliance. Um, the Fafada, like I said earlier, we need to make sure that Fafada is be, being reported properly. If you are, if you do have a sub grant that's more than the that's thirty thousand or more, it has to be um, reported um, in in the Fafada. Grant managers and award administrators uh, not taking financial management training or have expired certificates. Uh, that's a finding and that's a write-up. And if a grant manager or financial person leave and a new person is added, please read, uh, please make sure that new person takes financial management training. I know on the bottom of all my emails, and I believe Amy's as well, you will find links for financial management training, PMT, OCFO, um, and just grants. So if you ever get an email from us, you'll automatically have links um, that's on our emails, unauthorized ob um, obligations, um, spending money when you have a hold on your award condition, spending money before you got a contract or sub award in place, spending money in categories that have not been approved for funds or just buying stuff that's not on your budget. Um, those are all considered um, unauthorized obligations. So um, just be careful and make sure you're following your um, your budget, your approved budget, um, accounting policies and procedures um, that are not documented or need improvements. That's something that we look at when we're on the visit. So just make sure your accounting policies and procedures are current. And if you at the department do not know the city or county or the agency's policies and procedures, please ask your finance person for a copy of them because you have to follow them just like they do. So um, become good friends with your accounting office um, to make sure everyone is on point and everyone is on the same page. Okay, next slide. Um, inadequate subaward uh, management and monitoring policies. I've written people up. Um, I haven't had this problem with SPI because usually the subawardee and the grantee are working together. Um, but I've had grantees that put out subawards 
and never communicate with a sub grantee. Um, don't have documentation, cannot tell me what they're doing, you know, as a sub grantee. So with SPI, uh, I don't think this will be a problem. If that's a problem, then we have a bigger problem. So um, just make sure that you are in constant communication. Um, procurement transactions and policy, not conducting the open and free competition. Um, like I said, that's something that we're really big on. So make sure that when you put your RFP or RFQ out, um, you keep record in when your bids and everything come in that you have records of everything. Now, if you put something out and only one person or agency or company respond to it, that's fine. At least you put it out there. We're just asking you to put it out there. We're not saying you got to get three bids. Um, we just need it to be competitive. Um, indirect cost rate change um, improperly or the rate expire. This is a major issue with monitoring and OJP. Um, either you don't have an indirect cost rate, that's happened, but you put it in your budget, um, or you the rate change and you're still charging the rate and your rate dropped. Um, that could be a major issue. If you get a new rate and your rate changed, please submit a budget modification so that can be approved a cop along with a copy of the new indirect cost rate. Um, consulting rates that exceed $650 a day. This is major. Um, we get a lot of pushback um, just because a person, just because you got a consultant, they don't automatically get $650 a day. That's not, uh, even though you can't go over, that's not always uh, automatic. Uh, if anyone wants to go over $650 a day, they must show us three examples or three invoices where they got paid that excess amount uh, for doing the exact same type of work. So, um, that's something that we have long discussions on. But if you ever run into that issue, please contact your grant manager um, so you can get prior approval. Sometimes the, that prior approval really will have to come um, above us. So um, if that just happens to be an issue or a concern, um, just please uh, make sure you contact the grant manager. Um, and next slide. Okay, closeouts. Your your war we in and uh, right now all the wars are ending on September the thirtieth. After your award in, you cannot draw down funds. Your account is automatically locked. You have one hundred and twenty days to um to close out your award. So that means you got to do all your liquidation and do your final FFR within 120 days. Once you submit your closeout package, um, we will review everything, send it to OCFO. If any money is due to you, OCFO will send you an email, CC in your grant manager, stating that we are opening your account for this time period. And you can draw it out and they will tell you the amount of money that's due to you. Um, when you, the, your award in, we will still need that final financial status report and that final performance uh, report. You cannot, you will not be able to draw down money without that final financial status report and that, that final performance report. And with SPI, we will also, we will not submit your closeout report um, for final approval until your, your final report that's due to CNA and to BJA has been approved. That report is separate from your PMT report. Um, there's a final report that would give an overall view on how the program went, went 
um, that will include the grantee and the researcher. Um, once that's submitted to CNA and is approved by CNA, it is submitted to BJA. Once CAPES approved it in BJA, we we'll attach it to your um, award package, and then we can send your, your award in for closeout. Um, I talk real fast. I know it's a lot of information, but are there any questions? Not so, seeing, Chris, okay. Not seeing any case law right now. And if anyone think of anything, just reach out to Amy and myself. Thank you, Gisela. I think the next set of, um, Next set of slides are just some of the resources that are available to you uh, to learn a little bit more about grants management. Uh, we've talked about the Just Grants system and uh, the, the link is at the bottom of these slides when we send them out. Uh, thank you, Amada, for putting all of the different ones that'll be there. There's Just Grants, there's the OJP Financial Guide, um, and then there's a way to subscribe to um, OJP releases and latest news. And here are some of the social media for BJA. The last set of comments that I'll have, and I'll go run through it really quickly, are really about what to expect from the training and technical assistance team as you go into working with uh, your SPI and developing it. Um, as Ken mentioned, we'll be working to get a training and technical assistance team assigned to you that'll include uh, law enforcement practitioners, researchers, as well as analysts to, to help you work through this um, action planning process and collaborate with you moving forward as you develop and implement your SPI. As a part of that, um, probably sometime in the early part of the new year, uh, we'll have, uh, we'll start up monthly calls with you all uh, to introduce you to your team, as well as get you started on the capacity assessment, start thinking about the action plan, and um, having you look forward to October of 2024 for the national meeting. Just real quickly, the capacity assessment is going to kind of look at a couple different aspects of your agency, including the scope of your SPI, um, how you all are using data, how long have you been potentially working with your research partner, how you're working with other entities that might be impacted by your SPI, including the community, prosecutors, um, community-based organizations, that kind of thing, and then um, a lens towards you know, some of the sustainability options as well. The action plan, which Ken talked about a little bit, is really kind of an expanded uh, proposal. It'll look at the identified problem, the approach that you want to do for your SPI. The part we usually ask for a little bit more details on would be the evaluation plan so that we can have an understanding of both the um, approach for your evaluation plan, the process or the uh, and or the outcome evaluation, as well as getting into some of the statistical tests that you might be running to understand the significance and the outcome variables that you're looking at. Um, there'll be a couple other aspects of it uh, that we are working on to give you guidance on as well, including incl community engagement and involvement, as well as sustainability. And then the last slide is the SPI national meeting. And given the timing for October of 2024, you'll have almost a full year of development and hopefully a little bit of implementation already on track with your SPI and the, the national meeting is meant to really reinforce some of the core principles of SPI, including collaboration, sustainability, use of data, as well as the, the research and evaluation side, and then give you some time to, to learn from each other, as well as current and former SPI sites about both the successes, but also having some pretty honest conversations about um, challenges as well as how sites address these challenges um, in in ways that uh, were productive and made sense for your site. So I know we ran through a little bit long. So this 
slide deck will be sent out after the event, probably in the next day or two. And uh, as soon as we have the webinar recording, we will send along the link that um, you all can share with the rest of your team. Are there any questions before we close? All right. Well, thank you very much for the time. Appreciate um, all of the uh, work that you guys are and will be doing on your SPI. And we look forward to working with you uh, over these next three years. Chip, is there anything you wanted to close with? Oh, not really, Chris. Uh... As I said before, this is, you know, this is a program that's near and dear to our hearts. Um, really, we just, we want to engage and we want to be helpful. I'll just leave it at that. Please, uh, please work with us. Great. Thank you all. Have a good day.